Hi, and welcome to another live Google Hangout at Breast Cancer Answers. I'm Dr. Jay Harness, the Medical Director of Breast Cancer Answers, and we have a really special guest with us today who I'm going to introduce in a moment. But, you know, as a full-time practicing breast surgeon, I've realized years ago about the whole importance of weight and particularly not only getting weight under control for breast cancer survivors, but also the importance of being overweight as far as a risk factor for breast cancer. So it's a real pleasure today to welcome uh, Dr. Melanie Irwin. Melody is an Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the Yale School of Medicine in New Haven, Connecticut. Melody, welcome to Breast Cancer Answers. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, it's great to have you. So one of the things that I noticed from this year's meeting of ASCO, and for our listeners and viewers who don't know what ASCO stands for, it's the American Society of Clinical Oncology, there was uh, two reports given at the annual meeting of ASCO this past June in Chicago, one of which is called LEAN, L-E-A-N study, that you're the lead author for, and the other is called SHAPE. Two, and I, I would appreciate it if you could share with our audience what the acronym LEAN stands for and sort of the thought processes behind the study and then obviously we'll want to get into the outcomes of the study. Sure, happy to. So LEAN stands for Lifestyle, Exercise and Nutrition Study. And this was a randomized trial that we conducted in 100 breast cancer survivors who had a BMI greater than or equal to 25. So that would classify them sort of as overweight or obese. And uh, the sort of the rationale for doing this study is based on a growing body of observational literature showing an association between overweight and obesity and being diagnosed with breast cancer, but also developing a recurrence or dying of breast cancer. And interestingly, um, there haven't been that many studies of trials, interventions done after a breast cancer diagnosis of how lifestyle changes such as exercise or weight loss may improve breast cancer outcomes. So we um, wanted to look at how weight loss and exercise might improve certain um, markers strongly related to breast cancer. Okay, now for our audience, you and I are used to the term randomized. We're used to the term prospective. Explain to the audience what a randomized study is and why these kinds of studies carry more value, if you will, or more weight to them than, let's say, other kinds of studies. Sure. So, um, for example, the, uh, some studies are called observational. They might be a, a prospective cohort study or a case control study, and they are, that's just what they are. They're observational, where you collect information from study participants and it can be cross-sectional, one point in time where you're just comparing and looking at associations with, say, weight and, and a various outcome. Um, and so they're very important. They generate hypotheses of where there might be an, uh, an association. But there is a lot of bias related to it. It could be that that, mar that variable, let's say obesity, is really a marker of something else. And so what you really need to do is um, test it in a trial design where you enroll people, in this case we enrolled women, breast cancer survivors who were about two years after diagnosis and they had a BMI of 25 or greater and at baseline we collected a lot of information. They had DEXA scans which measure bone density, lean mass, percent body fat. We did a, a fasting blood draw, they completed questionnaires, we did measured their weight, height um, and some other tests. And so at baseline, you collect all this data and then you randomize uh, the participants to either receiving an intervention, the weight loss intervention, or receiving usual care uh, in the standard of care of treatment and for, so, for, long, for however long. And in this trial, it was for six months. And so then at the end of six months, the intervention group has been receiving weight loss counseling. And for the lean trial, it was 11 counseling sessions um, over six months. And then the usual care group might just receive what is standard of care, which might be a brochure given to them. And then at six months, you collect all those measures again, a blood draw, questionnaires, DEXA scan, and, and other information. And then any changes you see, let's say in body weight or body fat or lean mass or blood biomarkers, 
you know would be related to the intervention because at baseline you know what the measures are and then they were randomized to one or two you know one one group or the other and you directly know that the the changes in that endpoint are related to the intervention okay that's very very good now just for further explanation in other words the women who were quote randomized they didn't have a choice which group they went into they were assigned randomly a number group one group two whatever correct that, that's right and so at baseline you collect all the baseline information and then you randomize so to be eligible for the study they have to be willing to be randomized to either group what we do is we offer our control group is really a wait list group so they're a control group for the study but at the end of the study when they're done they're then offered the whole intervention really for the benefit of them. It's, it's not so sure. much for research purposes anymore. Yep. And then let's explain BMI. You and I know that means body mass index. Yes. And generally I think we talk about greater than 30 as morbid obesity. But can you relate the greater than 25 roughly and how many pounds that would be for an average woman who is 20 BMI or 25 or greater, just even roughly, Melinda, without the exact numbers? Sure, yeah. So BMI, body mass index, is a measure of weight adjusted for height. Right. So we know that someone who's taller is probably going to weigh more than someone who's shorter. But for a given height, there are different weights that might classify someone as a normal weight, which is a BMI less than 25, or overweight or obese and so it might be for women who weighs about say 200 pounds and maybe is 5'4 or 5'5 she might be have a, a BMI of 30 or around there or a woman who's 180 pounds and is about 5'4 she might also be a BMI of around 30 so it's very easy to calculate your BMI there's so many online tools you can literally just Google BMI calculator and it'll bring it up and you just type in your, your height in inches and your weight in pounds and it'll tell you your BMI. Yeah, and actually being overweight is a risk factor for other things, isn't it? You're an epidemiologist, so we worry about what? Diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, all of those things, correct? All of these, yes. Yeah. So that's the beauty of kind of lifestyle behavior change, whether it be exercise and or, or weight management is that it affects a number of outcomes as you just mentioned diabetes heart disease a number of different cancers as well as quality of life so there are very few people I know who, when they start an exercise program at, at the end of that 30 minute exercise program they all feel good you know they everyone usually feels good after exercising the problem is finding the time to exercise and, and making it a priority but the nice thing about behavior change is it affects a number of outcomes compared to um, pharmacological therapies, whether it be um, a, a cholesterol lowering a medication or a hypertension medication, they're really only focused on that one pathway to improving various disease outcomes. Okay, wonderful. So you designed the study. You found the, how many women in both groups total were there? So it was actually a three arm trial okay. where two intervention groups, it was in person weight loss counseling telephone weight loss counseling and then the wait list control group and the, the reason we did that way was we were hope we hypothesized that telephone counseling would be as effective as in-person counseling and if we were able to show that which we did then it's a more cost-effective approach of weight management that we can offer in our cancer hospital here or other community organizations can offer that so we had about 33 per group um, with the, the you know who were randomized and then completed the trial we are still actually continuing this study where we've added some other novel measures we're calling it lean 2 um, so if there's anyone interested in this we, we are um, enrolling more women over the next year or two but yes lean 1 was about a hundred women that were enrolled outstanding so what were the results so we were really excited. At the first primary result was showing that telephone weight loss counseling was as effective as in-person and that both groups lost about on average 6% body weight loss. And for some women they might say, oh, 6% is not that much. If I weigh 200 pounds, that's just a, about 12 pounds. But we know from, a, from the literature that a 5% weight loss is actually quite clinically meaningful, especially for cardiovascular disease. 
And so when we looked at biomarkers, which are surrogate markers of breast cancer, markers that we measure in the blood that we know are strongly related to breast cancer, such as CRP or C-reactive protein, which is a measure of chronic inflammation in the body. Um, when we looked at CRP levels at baseline and then again at six months, we saw a decrease in CRP of 30% with a 5% weight loss. So really exciting findings because we know that high CRP levels are associated with a higher breast cancer risk and mortality. So anything that we can to lower this um, marker of inflammation is a, is a good thing. We also showed favorable changes in insulin, which is a growth factor for breast cancer. Um, and insulin has been receiving a lot of attention. Uh, right now there are, are uh, drug trials of uh, metformin, which is a medication that lowers insulin, and looking at if that should become a standard of care for breast cancer treatment. Should women be put on metformin to decrease insulin levels? So our research showing that a 5% weight loss decreases insulin levels, we found about a 15% decrease in insulin, um, that this is another way to lower the risk of recurrence and mortality. Wow, the, this is really exciting. Now there's been a fair amount talked about. Uh, Andy Weil comes to mind, when he, he's been one of the advocates about uh, anti-inflammatory diets. And in, so the diet recommendations that were made for these patients, did they sort of follow the anti-inflammatory approach? What, what kinds of things did you recommend diet-wise for patients? Yeah, great question. So the way we came up with the um, weight loss uh, intervention was we started with the Diabetes Prevention Program, their, um, their intervention, which was a very successful program with a land landmark paper that came out in the New England Journal in 2002 which was looking at preventing diabetes and what they had three groups a lifestyle intervention group with weight loss and exercise versus a metformin group which is this insulin lowering medication versus control and they actually had to stop the trial early because the lifestyle group was so effective in lowering risk of diabetes they had a 58 percent lowered risk um, reduced risk of diabetes compared to about a 30% with metformin and compared to, uh, th these were compared to the control group. So since that trial came out um, 12 years ago, there's been a lot of literature on the diabetes prevention program. And in fact, you can, the YMCA's offer the, what is called the DPP, diabetes prevention program. So we started with that, but what we did is we adapted it for a breast cancer population. So we looked at the current recommendations by the American Cancer Society, the American Institute for Cancer Research, as well as the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines of exercise, and followed their guidelines and make, made sure that it incorporated those. And so it was a very specific intervention for breast cancer survivors. But interestingly, it wasn't a diet what we promoted. We promoted a lifestyle change. So Maura Harrigan, who was uh, the registered dietitian on the study, she's also a CSO, which is a certified specialist in oncology nutrition. Um, really, uh, it, you know, the first kind of focus was on portion control, and then it was a plant-based diet. So thinking about when you eat a meal, um, animal products being a condiment on your plate, not kind of, you don't plan a meal going, what is the meat I'm going to have, and then planning the side dishes, but you actually have a more plant-based diet, which is two-thirds of your plate when you look at your plate, and, and a third of it maybe, or even less than a third, being more animal products. So it was very much focused on that, um, making lifestyle changes, increasing exercise to um, ideally two and a half hours per week of moderate intensity exercise and 10,000 steps a day using a pedometer um, and really changing their lifestyle rather than telling the women you can't eat this or you should eat that because we're getting away from a, um, a you know a, a diet that's focused on one kind of um, food product or something but more looking at the whole diet. Oh that's outstanding again as well. Now it sounds to me like the buddy system is what's working here. In other words, I see patients, uh, Melody, every day of the week. I'm uh, chagrined to say how many of those are continue to be overweight as survivors. I keep pleading with them and saying, look, uh, heart healthy, uh, exercise, weight reduction, obviously the things of not smoking, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they all shake their head, yes, I really need to do that, and blah, 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 blah. And I see them back six months later and nothing has changed. 
So it sounds like from both the in-person as well as the phone intervention that having that connection yeah. is really important. In effect, you're creating a buddy system in, in some respects. Is that is that fair? Yeah, that, I agree. There's probably a huge component to that. The is it um, just having a counselor who meets with you either over the phone or in the per, or in person that really elicits these behavior changes, um, or or not? Can it work without that? So I think um, there are a lot of growing programs in hospitals and in communities that can allow that. In fact, the Livestrong Foundation partnered with the YMCA a couple of years ago to offer free three-month-long exercise programs at various Ys across the country. You also get a free gym membership to the Y during those three months. And there are twice-a-week sessions in small groups. So this is any cancer. It's not just breast cancer who, who's allowed to go to these programs. Um, and it's, it's so there's 24 sessions over the three months and that allows you to get uh, familiarized with the gym the equipment there but you have the personal trainer but eventually the personal trainer goes away and you really have to be able to motivate your, yourself to do it but now there are so many great opportunities with different apps um, and websites where people can go on and have kind of a group environment and motivate each other by logging what they did that day how many steps they walked and kind of making it a fun competition with their online partner and, and whatnot. Right. There's a number of ways to get around that. We actually have also um, just received funding from AICR, which is the American Institute for Cancer Research, to disseminate the lean intervention. And the way we're going to do that is we had this wonderful book that guided the 11 sessions that we developed specifically for the lean study. And the women loved it, and they, they kept asking us, can we give this to our friends who have breast cancer or even their friends who don't because they felt that the information was relevant regardless of their diagnosis and we said you know we wanted to say yes but we were a little bit hesitant based on the question you just asked is is this um, lean intervention effective without the counseling if we just give women this book that we felt was evidence-based and developed based on some great um, information and now tested in the lean study is it enough so what we're doing now is we're enrolling 200 women from around the country so all they have to do is we'll, we'll speak to them over the phone and then they'll be um, randomized either receiving the book and we'll measure we'll have their weight at baseline and at six months and we're adapting the book to be used without the counseling sessions so we're hopeful that we can see some weight loss with this evidence-based book and if so it's a product that can be available in cancer hospitals and other organizations and, and whatnot. We, we do hypothesize we might see an attenuation in weight loss, so not as much weight loss as you would see with counseling, but nonetheless, it you know, what our real problem is in our society is weight gain. Right. If we can prevent weight gain and even promote a little bit of weight loss, that's, that's a really good thing. Yeah, you just beat me to it because, as you know, women on tamoxifen tend to gain weight. Uh, the weight gain is actually one of the complaints that I hear pretty regularly. Now, you've got me all excited about this book of yours. It, it's not available right now, right? No, because we're just starting the study. Because, as I said, we want to adapt it and test it. So we can sure. then say in a year from now, this book led to a X percent weight loss you know um, and it's evidence-based it's specific for breast cancer and then maybe if it's really good then we can adapt it for other cancers as well sure but we, we would rather do that approach that than just making it available now because um, we do have to adapt it since the um, counseling sessions won't be a part of it right well listen uh, Melody uh, you've got to put down and I'm going to ask the staff at Breast Cancer Answers to mark down to get a hold of you when it's available as I've shared with you, we have nearly 700,000 followers at Breast Cancer Answers. That would we be wanna wonderful. Be, we want to be one of the first to let the world know about your book. Great. Now, one of the things, uh, and looking over the results of your study, uh, I'm excited as I can be because this is really scientific evidence, particularly on the biomarkers, which we know are important, that you can reduce it, and it's only, as you said, a 5% weight loss. Melody, where are we on actually improving survival? And is there any data that you're aware of that following programs like this are going to improve survival? Here's what I tell patients. I say, look, 
as a group, we believe that women who are heart healthy, get their weight under control, exercise regularly, as a group are going to do better. It's not a guarantee because of the variability of the biology of breast cancer. But can, can you share with our audience anything about sure. uh, actual outcomes, survival outcomes? This is a critical question and one that we, the, um, the field of epidemiologists and oncologists have been trying to receive funding to do for five plus years now, looking at a, a weight loss or exercise or and or exercise trial on recurrence and survival endpoints in women with breast cancer. And it's a very expensive trial because you have to enroll you know, a, you know, two, three thousand women, um, and they're in the intervention for a couple of years, and um, it's it's expensive. And so, pharmaceutical industry isn't really um, motivated to fund such a trial because it's lifestyle related. And the NIH would love to fund it, but there's some um, you know limited budget available. So, um, in turn, without having recurrence and mortality endpoints, that's why we can do more cost-effective trials that are a year long or six months long looking at these surrogate biomarkers but it's still critical that we get that research because that will be the definitive data showing that a five percent weight loss actually decreases your risk of recurrence or mortality by say twenty or thirty or forty percent there is um, talk right now and I'm very hopeful that next year a trial will be funded um, hopefully led by Jennifer Ligabel at Dana-Farber um, I've been lucky to uh, be involved in the design of this and hopefully the carrying out of this study. It will probably be done through the NCI cooperative group. Um, so hopefully next year that trial will be open and, and um, breast cancer survivors can uh, take part in it. Yeah, no, that would be absolutely awesome and, and really exciting. Uh, any data that you're aware of as far as the surrogate markers? We talked about C-reactive protein, insulin levels, any other data that you're familiar with as they relate to survival. Yeah, so talking about sort of the SHAPE2 study, that was done in healthy postmenopausal women, but their endpoint that they were really focused on was estrogen concentrations or estradiol or estrone, sex hormones. So we know for women, estrogen is, uh, high estrogen levels are, are not good for breast cancer risk and or prognosis. Um, so in fact, in the early 2000s, the Women's Health Initiative trial showed some results that actually told women to stop taking hormone replacement therapy. Um, it was increasing risk for cardiovascular disease as well as for we had known for breast cancer. So women stopped taking that. And we also know for those women diagnosed with an estrogen receptor positive breast tumor, which is about 70% of women diagnosed with breast cancer, that they the standard of care is to take tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor and these are anti-estrogens um, and so this is now standard of care because we know estrogens are not good so fortunately for the SHAPE2 study and previous trials before that the new trial and the PATH uh, study done by Ann McTiernan at Fred Hutch um, we, they showed that exercise and weight loss were able to decrease estrogen concentrations by about 10 to 15 percent and these were changes seen over a year so you can imagine if you ha you know manage your weight and exercise more than a year you might even see uh, larger decreases in these estrogen concentrations so that's a very important biomarker to look at for risk and prognosis okay fantastic now you've started to talk about shape two that mm -hmm. was the other pa major paper presented at the ASCO meeting in June could you give our audience just a brief overview of what shape two was about Sure, yes. Yeah. So SHAPE2 was a study, as I mentioned, in healthy postmenopausal women who were not taking any hormone replacement therapy, and they were non-smokers, uh, which is the majority of, of women, and they were randomized to one of three groups. They were randomized to either a uh, caloric restriction where they decreased their caloric intake by 500 calories a day, or an exercise group where they increased their exercise, um, doing daily, say, 30-minute sessions of moderate intensity exercise, but they also decrease their caloric intake by 250 calories, so half the amount in the diet group, but still a little bit of a caloric restriction, or a control group. And what they found was similar reductions in the biomarkers among the, the exercise and the caloric restriction group, but with exercise they showed favorable changes in body composition. 
So we know when we lose body weight, if you don't exercise, if you lose weight just through diet, you actually have loss in muscle mass and maybe even some loss in bone mass. Um, but if you exercise as well, then you can even maintain that bone loss and actually increase your muscle mass. So their kind of conclusion was that the exercise group was the uh, was associated with the most favorable changes. Um, the one sort of limitation I would say is, um, it you know the exercise group did also request uh, ask them to decrease their caloric intake by 250 calories, and so the mechanism of favorably changing sort of the the biomarkers, the sex hormones, really is weight loss. But it should be with exercise, not just diet, so that you see favorable weight loss, which is body fat with the maintenance or increase of lean mass. So an important study showing the importance of exercise, that that is um, necessary with um, uh, caloric restriction. Oh, fantastic. Now, are there any plans for a shape three? I'm not sure. Um, what they should do is follow the study participants after they finish right. the intervention to look at maintenance of weight loss. Maybe it is those randomized to the exercise group were able to maintain their weight loss better than the diet only group. Uh, so it would be interesting to see, you know, one year later what the biomarkers and body composition results were. Well, fantastic. Well, Dr. Melody Irwin, this has just been a spectacular Google Hangout. What are your final thoughts? What are the, sort of the bullet messages that we should share as we wrap up here? Yeah, I think it's really important um, that individuals take the time to really kind of look at their lifestyle. And it's, it's, we live in a really difficult environment. It's not an environment that's easy to exercise and or eat healthy. So knowing that as a backdrop, it really takes a lot of our own motivation to, to ch make a favorable lifestyle change. But there are a growing number of resources out there. Talk to their clinician, their general practitioner, their oncologist look online. There are a growing number of programs in communities that are free, that are um, evidence-based, and that will really help them make the uh, start of these favorable lifestyle changes. Well, listen, I want to thank you. She's Dr. Melody Irwin, Associate Professor of Epidemiology at Yale. We want to thank you wholeheartedly for being with us. We want to encourage our audience to Keep tuning in to Breast Cancer Answers. We look forward to another live Google Hangout with you. Have a heart-healthy day. Good day. Thank you.